wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa allah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna sayyidina muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in amma ba'da fa ya ibadullah ufsikum wa nafsi aw wala bittaqwa la ta'ala wa ta'atihi that is our praise is due to allah who loves humility in his creation loves for his creatures to be humble and he dislikes arrogance there's nothing worthy of worship except allah who guides to the straight path whom he pleases and he allows to stray whom he pleases we witness that nothing deserves worship except allah who's one alone having no partners having no associates there's nothing like or comparable to him and we witness that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is god's servant and his messenger we pray that the prayers the peace the high exaltation be upon our prophet and upon his companions his family who call to the way of their lord with wisdom and excellent preaching and may allah be pleased with them ramadan mubarak <clears throat> it is indeed a great pleasure to be here with you continuing the tradition of our imam of our leader and our teacher imam waridin muhammad who established the ramadan sessions as a tradition that every year we would take time out to come together and study the quran and study it in a very studious way to try to get out of the quran guidance for our lives and guidance to take us collectively where we need to go I want everyone to realize that what's happening with us is miraculous. It's truly miraculous that in less than 35 years <clears throat> Imam Muhammad led the largest religious change in modern history in modern history sometimes when you're part of a thing you don't realize how significant the thing is because it's just normal to you it's just very normal but to collectively move collectively to collectively move a large group of people from a proto proto movement a proto islamic movement that had captured the imagination of many You know, as a student of the Nation of Islam, I'm not a I'm not, I was never a member of the Nation. I think for one year of my life I was a member of the Nation of Islam. And I was so young uh I don't remember a whole lot of it. I remember the nostalgia for sure. I remember all the stories for sure. You know, my father had some pictures. And on the envelope it said NOI days, NOI days. But when i read the envelope it sounded like it looked like it said in ut days so i was a little thrown off i said dad what are you talking about nut days <laughs> but to to be able to win the confidence 
of such a large number of people to bring you from a um, theological idea that's problematic, that's problematic, to accept a whole nother idea and keep the impetus intact is miraculous. To take a community that was preaching that America was doomed, that America was going to eventually burn up, who literally believed in a mothership. Now, some of you say, yeah, I ain't never believed in mothership. But I hear stories, some people used to go looking for the mothership. Right? To get that same group of people to not only leave away from the idea that America was doomed, but lead them to pick up the Constitution of the United States of America and to be able to see the Constitution of the United States of America in such a way that did not conflict with the core values of their religion and to help a whole group of people rearrange their thinking and to come to understand that, these, that this wonderful idea, no matter how flawed, no matter how flawed the men were who formulated the idea, we have to understand that everybody is not Rajul Temu like Muhammad the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad, our perception of him is he is the perfect human being. But even in being the perfect human being, we see he, he, he made uh, mistakes, right? He erred, not like, he didn't err like we err. He didn't, he didn't commit gross sin. He didn't give in to, 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 to gross um, behavior that disrespected the nature that God uh, had for him, but he erred. You know, and then God would correct him. If you remember, <laughs> he frowned and turned away because um, um Mahtum, Abdullah Um Mahtum, uh, was trying to have a conversation with him, and he was trying to impress uh, the importance of accepting this universal way of life among those who were more influential in the society. And here comes the blind man. Now, there's some interpretations that say this wasn't actually the prophet, that this was someone else in his community. Right? Now, the Imam, Imam Muhammad didn't say that. Imam Muhammad said that Allah was using the prophet to show a deficiency in his people. Understand what I mean? So this was an issue that the Arabs had in general. And Allah was using the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to, to, to bring attention to this um, 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 uh, issue they had in their society in which they gave more importance to those who were influential in the society and not those who, who were meek in the society. But if you study the totality of the Prophet's life, peace be upon him, he gave extra attention, extreme attention to those who were marginalized and those who were disenfranchised in the society. But in this instance, he was annoyed by the man who was coming to him, trying to find guidance and seeking after him because he was engaged in the conversation and the man was extremely persistent. And as you know, eventually the prophet got a little um, uh, irritated with the man and he turned away from him. And, and God did not let this sit without addressing it, without admonishing it. God sent revelation in the Quran that said Abasa wa tawalla, right? He frowned and turned away when the man came to him. And it goes on to discuss how here was one man looking for guidance, looking to be guided by God. And here's another man that no matter how much you told him, his heart wasn't going to change. Right? But you were so your attention was so much given to the man who you wanted to change that you didn't give your attention to the man who wanted to change, right? So here you have Muhammad, the perfect man, right? 
Now, none of us can live up to that model of perfection. Meaning, most of us have sinned more uh, in the last week than the prophet sinned in his entire lifetime. Maybe not Ramadan. We're extra holy during Ramadan. Right? We got it together during Ramadan. We don't backbite during Ramadan. We don't gossip during Ramadan. We don't, we don't uh, uh, slander during Ramadan. You know, and, and let's make dua we're not those Muslims that break the fast gossiping, right? You haven't got a date or anything, and you're already calling to pick up on your bad habits. Let's make dua that we're not, that we don't reflect that, right? But many of us make more mistakes just this year than in Prophet made in his entire lifetime, right? But I only say that to say this, sometimes we think if a man is not perfect, that there's an issue with his ideas, right? But that's not the case. You have to look at the ideas because the ideas will stand out above the individual because we are all trying to live up to our ideas. We are all espousing a set of ideas and we're trying to live up to those ideas. So yes, the founders of the, the framers of the language of the Constitution were flawed. Yes, some of them had slaves. Yes, some of them uh, uh, did things that seemed to contradict the very ideas that they were putting in the language of the Constitution. However, that was not their plan. It was the plan of God. So when it's written in the language, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable human rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? When we hear these ideas that are being espoused, it, 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 it shows that these men were blessed with great insight. And Imam Muhammad, instead of divorcing these ideas and, and, and only pointing out the flaws in the men who framed these ideas, no, he pointed out the good in the men who framed these ideas and he made us comfortable being American citizens and, 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 and encouraged us to claim our rights as American citizens. And as long as, and I remember reading, you know, I, I, you know as a student, as a person who, who was 71 when the transition began, my study of the transition is not like your study of transition. Your study of the transition is you live the transition. Many of the things that I read about in a book that I was too young to perceive consciously, you lived it. You experienced it. And that makes the collective value of your experience priceless for our community. The collective, the, 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 add, the additive value, you know, um, there was, had to be 500 people at Juma today who were pioneers. 500 people. And if each of you has been in the religion 30 years, that means collectively there was 15,000 years worth of experience in Juma today. And that is many lifetimes, many lifetimes worth of experience that is now available for us to learn from, that's available for us to benefit from. Collectively, inshallah. But back to this idea about the Constitution. So Imam Muhammad made it, made, took one people who were preaching that America was going to fall, America was going to burn up, that planes were going to come and drop bombs and all these things, and only certain people would be taken up. In under 35 years, transformed that community to a legitimate Islamic community that is completely Genuine. That is not just a carbon copy of another Muslim community. That's not a intellectual colony of another expression of Islam. That somebody didn't come and take their minds and put them in our minds so that we have our bodies, but we have a different mind governing our body. So everything we say, everything we express, everything we do is not expressing our unique experience, is not expressing what 
we earn by value of 400 years of chattel slavery, but is expressing what someone else wants to express who came from another place to set up a mental colony in our mind to espouse their ideas. We're not suffering collectively from that. By the mercy of Allah, we are completely genuine. And not only are we completely genuine, we are completely legitimate and we have a legitimate authentic expression of the religion that is in line with the Quran and in line with the life example of Muhammad the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to do that in under 35 years is miraculous <laughs> do you know how long it takes to bring about change long time right but in under four years the imam had dismantled the philosophical web of the of, of what was at that time the nation of Islam and in four years you went from thinking you were gods I don't know how you sisters did it man because as flawed as us brothers are, I couldn't have went for it. I said, you ain't no God. <laughs> nah, man, you, ain't, you, you might be a good brother, but you ain't God. Right? But under four years to dismantle that, right? Dismantle that, and then also introduce to you or us collectively a whole new ideology but helping us stave off the bad influences of wrongful Muslim culture. It's, it's a miracle. We are living, we are living miracles. And when the history is written, and we have to write it, because if we don't write it, somebody else is going to write it. And I, I don't mean to play on a, on, a, on, a, on a popular cliche, but then it will really be his story. And it won't be your story. And when it goes down in history, the world will testify that the most influential leader for Islam in the 20th century and the one of the most important, actually the most important figure in a genuine indigenous expression of Islam in the United States of America was Imam Waraduddin Muhammad. Allahu Akbar. And no one will be able to argue with it. No one. And many of the things Imam Muhammad introduced 30 years ago, that at that time those who were not born and raised in America couldn't understand, many of the same sentiments that they were criticizing 30 years ago, after 9-11, all of a sudden, the light hit them. And the sun came up. And they realized we got to become, we have to indigenize Islam to America. But then it's forced. If you do it that way, you're forcing it as a reaction. Imam Muhammad never did it as a reaction. He did it organically. And that's why we are very blessed and very much situated to offer America leadership in these troubling times. And don't allow anyone, and I, I'll, we'll visit this again tomorrow. We're not finished. Tomorrow we're going to talk about Arham, the wounds that bore us, and the importance of not severing ties with the wounds that bore you, and the danger of severing ties with the wound that bore you. But don't allow anyone to, dis to, allow to, to, to make you as an individual disconnect yourself 
with the intellectual and spiritual legacy of Imam Waris with Muhammad. Don't allow it. You keep your own mind, you keep your own intelligence, and your own thinking. And as time will tell, Allah will show the productivity. Inshallah. We're talking today about Abraham alayhi salatu wasalam. And I wrote some ayahs on the board, inshallah, for you to write down, for you for us to take notes. But our overall topic for the weekend is as salah, devotional obedience. Our prayer. Prayer in light of the Quran, the Sunnah, and the commentary of Imam Waris bin Imam. That's our topic this weekend, inshallah, that we will be discussing through that we will, that we will be discussing throughout the weekend. I did send the PowerPoint presentation to the organizers of the session. However, I have to admit I didn't send it till yesterday. So, but they do have it, and they will have it available, inshallah, tomorrow. You will have the whole or most of the PowerPoint. You always change things. I was changing stuff last night. I changed things on the plane. So there's going to be a few changes, but for the most part, you'll have the PowerPoint presentation to follow through, inshallah. What time is iftar here? SubhanAllah, 8.40? SubhanAllah. Glad I live in Houston. These are the thesis statements for our discussion. These statements are extremely important for understanding. At the end of the day, some of the messages that will be communicated. And one is Imam Muhammad 2, 12, 1, 2001, the spiritual material establishment, how they work to, to uh, how they are to work in Al Islam. This was in the Ramadan session. Masjid Taqwa, Chicago, Illinois. And we should, as much as possible, we should, when we quote Imam Muhammad, we should give you a source. Because everybody got a quote. Everybody got, and, and, and I do too. I got stuff Imam Muhammad told me personally. In personal conversation. Right? But at the end of the day, the more, and there's, there's going to be some things in here that I quote that I, I, I can't give you a specific source for. But as we move along, it's very important for us to source out our information for those who are students. Because it allows the students to go back and study it, to verify it, and expand upon it. Inshallah. So here Imam Muhammad says, but understand that prayer is a picture of the rise and fall of civilization. And the rise and fall of civilization is not the rise and fall of industry, the rise and fall of civilization is the rise and fall of human life in its excellence. Right? So prayer is a picture. Picture. And what, and what do people say about a picture? A picture is worth a thousand words, right? So you go ask many Muslims today about their prayer. Why do you make qiyam? Why do you make ruku? Why do you make sajda? Why do you make jalsa? What will they tell you? Prophet did it. Right? Or, I don't know. What my parents taught me. Right? But, the salat is like a book. So then the next quote. We know that tra tradition was created to preserve knowledge. Traditions are not meaningless. Traditions have great meaning. And what tradition is the cliche for Muslims? What tradition, whenever they talk about Muslims, what tradition do they show? Salat, right? That's the tradition, right? That's the, whenever, whenever, whenever you, Whenever anybody wants to talk about Muslims and any show about Muslims, you can hear the adhan, right. and you see people making salat, right? Yeah. This is a tradition. 
Salah is a tradition. Wudu is a tradition. The Adhan is a tradition. And all these traditions are like books holding knowledge. Right? And Imam Muhammad read the books and shared with us what God showed him when he read the books. So that when you and I are asked, why, don't, why do you make Qiyam? You don't have to say, I don't know. Why do you make Guruku? You, your response won't be, I don't know. You'll be able to show that in the Salah is a picture of the rise and fall of civilization. And if you follow the pattern of the picture, then you can rise your own civilization. You can make your own civilization raise up. You can make your own life raise up. So again, this, this, this great wisdom that we're going to be sharing from the Imam, it's just not for us to sit around and talk about how heavy it is. That was deep. I remember the Imam, and, and you go get the Ramadan session 2007. He said, people talk, talk about, they say, man, that was so deep, my head was hurting. The Imam said, if it's that deep, then leave. If, if it's making your head hurt, then leave. So you're not ready for this. He said, you just go home, watch some television or something. Go watch a sitcom, right? You're, you're, you're not ready for this. So as we share this information, don't just take it and, 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 and just like be like a kid marveling at a new toy. Take it and apply it in your life because it's only effective when you apply it in your life and you can benefit from it. Here are the chapters. We have eight chapters. We have to go through. Chapter 1, prayer and the order of Abraham. Prayer and the order of Abraham. Chapter 2, why do we pray? Chapter 3, the ascension and the prayer. Muhammad's ascension to paradise. I'm sorry, that's, I'm sorry. We got nine chapters. I got to fire my secretary. I got to get on my secretary's case. That's wrong. I am my own secretary, so I got to get on my own case. <laughs> All right, so chapter three is the ascension in the prayer. Chapter four, the times of prayer and their symbolic meanings. There's a reason we pray at Fajr and Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. Chapter 4, Fard and Sunnah prayers. Yeah, you have a question? Oh, chapter 5, thank you. He's correcting me. Thank you. Chapter 6, six washing for prayer. Chapter 7, the Adhan. Chapter 8, the Qibla. And chapter 9, the established prayer and its symbolic meaning. And inshallah, we'll finish chapter 12, I mean chapter 9, sometime on Sunday. Inshallah. Chapter 1, prayer and the order of Abraham, the dua of Abraham. But before we get there, we want to draw your attention to uh, um, uh, verse 2, 286. So, uh, cha Surah 2, chapter 2, verse 286. No, no, no. I have a strained back. Yeah, I need a solid chair. Thank you. He was going to bring me that nice, comfortable chair, and I want the metal chair because I, the, the, I need the flat surface. So if you look into 286, Allah says, La yukallifu nafsin illa wus'aha. Wus'aha. La yukallifu Allahu nafsin illa wus'aha. So here. Did y'all write this down? Write 2 and 124. Okay, so I, cause I'm going to erase this. And 4 and 126 and 
this. Wusaha. Allah does not place a burden on any soul greater than it ha greater than it has the capacity to bear. Now when you look at this, Nafs is soul. Okay. Kalifa, kalifa, this will be the burden, the burden. Illa means except. Wus'aha. And they translate this, can bear, right? Now, wus'aha comes from the word. Wa si'a. Wa si'a. Wa si'a. Okay. And wa si'a means to expand. To expand. Imam Mansur let us in uh, reciting ayatul kursi. Wa si'a kursi yuhu samawati wal ard. Right? His throne expands. The length of the heavens and the earth. Right? Allah says, Wasi'a kulli shay bil ilmi wa rahma. That He expands everything with knowledge and mercy. So Wasi'a means to expand. Right? So let's 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 understand this in the context of human life. Can a little baby crawl? Little baby, can it crawl? Somebody said not in the beginning. Okay, why can't it crawl in the beginning? Huh? It does not have the strength yet. What is stopping it from crawling? Motor skills, balance. But what else? What's the major thing? Gravity. Right? Gravity is holding the baby down, right? Right? So even when it starts to stand up, what happens? Fall right back down, right? It'll stand up again, boom. Stand up again, boom. Now what would happen if we told that baby, in a way he could understand, you are never going to walk. And kept him, you're never going to walk. You're never going to walk. You're never going to walk. What would happen after it fell down three or four times? It's going to give up, right? Because you have conditioned it to think it's never going to walk. Right? Good thing babies don't understand us at that age. Right? Cause we call them bad. Now we're Muslims. We don't do this. But if you you so bad, right? But the baby doesn't know. The baby doesn't know anything. It knows that it has a drive to walk. So it keeps trying and keep trying and keep trying, and eventually its muscles wasi eye. Its muscles expand. Right. It first stands up and it wobbles and falls. It stands up again, it wobbles and falls. But eventually, its ability to perceive its balance, why is it, right? It expands so that it can stand up and find its two feet and it won't wobble, right? right? Then its ability to manipulate its fine motor skills and propel itself forward. Eventually, take one or two steps, right, and fall. But after a while, why is it, it expands, right? And eventually, that baby begins to walk. And we're all excited, right? Then eventually, it can run, right? And it keeps getting bigger. And keep getting bigger, right? And when at first, it couldn't get its own glass of water. Then eventually, it can get its own glass of water. When at first, it couldn't cook its own meal. Eventually, it can cook its own meal. When at first, it couldn't pay its own rent. Eventually, it can pay its own rent, right? So some of y'all are saying, I wish that time would come. This is expansion. Man, when I first got married, I worked at 
Denny's and Burlington Coat Factory. I think I'm making seven fifty an hour, and then whatever I made on tips. And some nights tips were good, and some nights tips were bad. And I never forget. I was happy. I was young. I was happy. I had me a small house. I was talking to Imam Kassim, my teacher, my personal friend and mentor and teacher. And I was telling him how happy I was in my small apartment. And I tell him, man, I could be happy like this for the rest of my life. He said, well, if that's what makes you happy. He said, but that's kind of a confining. There's no room for growth. At that time, I couldn't imagine having six children. Now I have six children. And I never forget what my wife told me. I'm no longer going to work. Man, I went through some changes. <laughs> because although she didn't have to, man, that paycheck was a mercy. Her paycheck was a mercy. It was a nice paycheck, too. She's a pharmacist. It was a mercy. Man, so I had got used to having that help. You know, she was out of her sadaka. She was helping out. And she said, I'm not working. It was our sixth child. And she, 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 she only stayed home for like six weeks to two months with each child. She said, I am not going back to work again. Talk about expansion. Ooh -wee. <laughs> because it all became my response. Everything became my, every bill became my responsibility. Everyone. Gas bill, light bill, cell phone bill, her bill. She used to handle her own bills when she had a job. Once she, once she stopped working, I had to pay for her bills. Everything. And I never forget. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But the strain and the burden brought out a new man in me. By Allah's mercy, I became a new man. Yes. And yes, we had to we had to adjust. We couldn't we couldn't have lobster. We had to have lentils in some nights and rice some nights. You know, we had to scale back. And she shocked me too. Because when she was working, she was a little more liberal. When she stopped working, I said, Look, sweetheart, we gotta get this grocery bill down. She worked miracles. We went from like a six hundred dollar a week grocery bill. I have six children, let me remind you. Because some people trip out when I say I spend $600 a week in groceries. They, <gasps> <laughs> I have six children. And I have a teenage boy. And I don't know. And he's skinny. Because yeah. he's the only one that, and Khalil, they may be the only two that know my boy. That boy is like this. I, I can almost put my whole hand around his arm. I don't know what he does with that food. He can eat and eat and eat and eat, right? And I have four girls. And I have to buy stuff for their hair. I mean, all, so all this, all this burden. And my wife would not accept to live in the ghetto. She wouldn't. See, she said, you all around traveling the country. You gone all the time. So you better put me in a neighborhood where I'm safe. Am I saying you can't be safe in the ghetto? Yes, you can be safe in the ghetto. But you have to have a special jacket. You have to have a ghetto jacket. When I lived in the ghetto, I bald my head and I grew a big beard and I always wore a big coat. Huge, a big coat. And I just looked crazy. <laughs> you know, nobody didn't bother me. They saw me and said, man, that guy crazy. I'm sure it was going around the mom. I mean, that guy crazy, man. Don't mess with him. So she would not accept to live in poverty. She demanded that I provide a certain level of care for her and the children. And this made me expand as a man. So that the next, so she started working again. Then recently, she drew back again. But this time I said, I got it, baby. I got this. It's all good. Why? Because it forced me to expand. And that is wasya. 
It doesn't mean that God is not going to place a big burden on you. It doesn't mean that God is not going to place a burden that's difficult. What it means is that God has given you in your human capacity that which is necessary to rise to meet whatever challenge that he gives you. And if you can't lift it today, today keep working on it. If you can't lift it today, keep, keep, keep struggling with it. Keep striving with it. And eventually, the thing that you had difficulty lifting today, tomorrow you will lift it with ease. i never forget freshman year football. I walked in. It's the ninth grade. I finally got out of junior high school. High school. My junior high school, I was big time. Defensive lineman. Strong. I was one of the biggest kids. I walked in there. I got on I got on the weight machine, you know, at the bar. The bar's like the bar weighs 45 pounds. I put a 35 on this side and a 35 on that side, right? So I was lifting, I thought I was doing something. 135 pounds. Then I looked over and I saw a senior, and he he had 225. Bloop, bloop, bloop. I was like, woo-wee. And then he got me too. By the time the end of the summer. I got to where I could put 45s on each side. I started at 35s. But then, I, if you know weights, weights, they're like 10, like 5, 10, 25, 35, 45, right? So I got two big 45s on each side. So, man, I thought I had accomplished something. So by the end of the summer, I was working out with 45s. The senior said, you'll get there, rookie. <laughs> but come my senior year of high school, 225, working out with. 275, working out, with, right? Why? Because why is it? My muscles had expanded. So, so look for the challenge. Enjoy the challenge. Embrace the challenge. And know that whatever challenge God gives you is going to cause you to grow. It's going to cause you to development. And God has given you the resources to expand enough to meet the challenge. La yukallifu nafsin illa wusaha. It gets every good that it earns, and it suffers every ill that it earns. This is extremely important for our topic of Abraham, the model, because he had a great challenge. He had a great challenge. So we can't go blaming other people if we don't do what it takes to meet the challenge. I can't get mad at this person or that person or that person or that person if I can't expand my muscles to meet the challenge. No, I didn't have enough discipline. I didn't have the proper regimen. Like right now, you go break your fast, you can't blame nobody. You drive down the street, you smell some church fried chicken. And you lose your mind. <laughs> now, by Allah's, inshallah, I always say inshallah, but I can't see, you know, I can't see my, me breaking my fast like that because I got wheat behind some chicken or something like that. I can't see that. Maybe being, maybe not handling my temper, maybe arguing, maybe, but I, I can't see that, that I couldn't resist some church fried chicken, no. Right? But, you can't blame nobody for that, right? You get up in the morning, you don't eat suhoor. See, in the middle of the day, you're hungry. Your stomach's growling. And the devil's calling you. No. You, 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 you have the capacity to do it. This is July. These are the longest days in the year. We just got into August, right? But these are the longest days in the year. When I was nine years old, we started fasting. My brother-in-law will tell you, he knew me when I was nine years old. Well, nine years old, we started fasting in El Paso, Texas. In the longest part of the year. So like now, been there, done that, and I was nine. Now how silly do I look at 40, breaking my fast, and I kept it when I was nine? Right? Well, this is the growth in your capacity to take on challenges. And if you keep practicing at it, you keep working at it, you're not going to gossip during Ramadan. 
You're not going to slander. You're not going to backbite. You're not going to do, you're not going to fill your mind with frivolous information. All you have to do is keep working at it. And Allah will expand that muscle. He, he will expand the capacity. Because this wasi is not talking just about physical. Right? It's also talking about mental. When you, when you were a kid, you could add one plus one and two plus two. And then eventually you could do two times two. And eight times eight. Right? And then you got into exponentials, right? 10 to the power of 3, right? Then you got into polynomials, right? 3x times 2 minus y equals 63. And you could figure out. And then you got into imaginary numbers. You know, in math, they have something called an imaginary number. Because they don't have, they don't really know how to express it. So they make up a number. Because it exists in the mathematical computation, but they can't figure out how to express it in the language. So they call it an imaginary number. And if you take two imaginary numbers and multiply them together, you get a real number. <laughs> that's, that's math, right? But you, so eventually you do these long formulas. Why is that? It's expanded, right? Your ability to be patient. Why is that? It expands. Right now, you may not be able to be patient that long, but you keep working at it. Each child, my patience has increased. Every one of my six children, I've gotten more patience. You have too. Your capacity to understand the Quran compared to 1975 is much broader now. So today, if I tell you as students of Imam Wadhafi Muhammad, don't just look at the prophets as flesh and blood people, but look at them as concepts, you have no problem with that. You can see things conceptually. You're not stuck on the literal expression of things. Why? Because your mind has been expanded. You can think about things deeper, right? One, you know one of, the, one, of, one, of the, one of the major milestones in the thought of a child is when they can go from thinking concrete to abstract? Right? So isn't that the same thing in religion? When you can go from looking at everything in religion as concrete and begin to see abstract concepts? Wasi'ah. Huh? Right? So inshallah, your 33 years of journey. I've been with you. I'm only, I'm only uh, 38 now. So it's been more than 33. 1975 to now. What's that, 36? 37. 37 years. The whole time, wasia, we've been expanding. And we have much more capacity today than we had when we were looking for Yaqub's island. So we could see where he grafted. That's a hell of a psychology the nation put on you. <laughs> that a big headed scientist grafted a man from the weak genes. He was playing with magnets, right? This is what it says, right? And then after he grafted this weak man, he made you the rule, he made him the rule over you for 400 years. That's a heck of a psychology. And Imam Muhammad unraveled it in four years. <laughs> After 33 years of indoctrination, he unraveled it in four years with no bloodshed. Look at what's happening in the Middle East right now. You see how hungry those people are for power? Imam Muhammad gave up his authority. He gave up his power. He, he, he removed himself from lording over you. Remember 1985, you are all independent. That's That's expansion. They say the big house. You know the big house, Chicago? They say the imam, he said, this house is too big. He said, I spend all day looking for my child, and by the time I find him, I'm too tired to play with him. <laughs> Why say that? Expansion, right? So now we see Abraham, alayhi salatu wa salam, who were on the order of Abraham. Turn, turn now, turn now in your Quran to 4 and 126. 
Remember wasi'ah now. Wasi'ah. Wasi'ah. Okay? Forum 126. And whose religion is better than one who submits his whole self to Allah? Now remember that. There's a certain type of advancement that we're not going to get if we're straddling the fence. I'm not, I'm not mad at anyone. If you're straddling the fence, look. Alhamdulillah. We all have our own struggles and challenges. But there's a certain type of development that you're not going to get unless you dedicate yourself towards it. This is not just in religion. This is in other areas of life too. You're not going to get success unless you fully commit to something. Unless you fully commit yourself to it, right? The well, same thing with religion. Same thing with Islam. Right? You can't be a weekend Muslim. I'm serious. You a Juma Muslim. You can't be that way. You have to be all the way in. And only by going all the way in Will you get and see the results that you want? And if you don't go all the way in, you're only going to see superficial partial results. So here Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ دِينَ Whose religion is better? Whose way of life is better? مِنْ مَنْ دِنْ وَنْ أَسْلَمَا وَجْحَهُ لِلَّهِ Who submits his whole continence to Allah. So Allah is not really asking you this question for you to answer it. No, this is a rhetorical question. Right? He's going to give you, he's going to give you the answer. In other words, there is not a person whose religion is better than this. Right? muhsinu, And he does good. Ibrahima, And he follows the order of Abraham. Hanif, Abraham Hanif, right? So this word, Hanif. Hanifan, right? He's also called Hanif. Ibrahim, Hanif. And Hanif means to be inclined. So Imam Muhammad said that this is man's natural inclination. To be upright. That Hanif speaks to man's natural inclination to be upright, meaning that man is naturally inclined to righteousness. That God has given him this as part of his nature. So here's Allah saying, who's, the, who's better than one who follows the way of Abraham? Allahu Ibrahima Khalil. And, and Allah took Abraham as a friend. Right? Well, let's look at Abraham's journey to being a friend of God. So we see Abraham as a child, right? Not a man. Yet, we see, with the beginning of the picture we see of Abraham, we see him as a child. <clears throat> Living in the house of the man who makes his industry on idolatry. If you can't see the parallels, I can't. 
They say a hint to the wise is sufficient. It's, this is one. I, 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 this is one of those. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, right? So here you have Abraham, and he has studied the ideas of his people and has found them to be lacking. He's concluded that idolatry, the Abraham principle, this is a principle at work here, studying the ideas that are in a culture and seeing that the ideas are wanting, that they are lacking. And this young man has to exercise great wisdom. You know, when you challenge the ideas of someone, it can be a very painful process for them. For somebody to realize what they have been believing in their whole life is wrong, can be a very painful process, but it's also a moment of truth. When the imam came out and he began to challenge the ideas of Black men God, white men devil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some people just couldn't see it. They couldn't make the change. Although it's, in, it's inherent in the conversation, it's only logical. If I cut the blood of any man, what color is it? And I can take the blood as long as it's, it's, it's compatible, right? You got A, and B, and O, right? And these different blood types, right? And as long as the blood type is compatible, and the blood type varies in every population of people, it's a big signs from God. Big signs from God, right? So that I can take the blood out of any man whose blood is, or woman, whose blood is compatible to yours from any place on the planet, and I can put it in your body, and your body will begin to use it. Right? Beautiful sign from God, right? So inherent in the message was the flaws of the message. But some people were making a living off the message. Some ministers got rich, beating the people down, oppressing the people, benefiting from this idea. So here comes a man who's changing everything. And that's problematic. Right? So watch here, Abraham. He has to do something to strike the consciousness of his people. Something drastic to strike their consciousness. To show them the flaws in their logic. So they leave partying. Y'all know the story. They go away and party, right? And Abraham smashes the idols. But in his wisdom, he realizes if he smashes all the idols, then he won't get his message across. So he leaves an idol. See the wisdom here? He leaves the biggest idol. He doesn't destroy the biggest idol. But he places the instrument of destruction in the possession of the biggest idol. So if people come back and they're shocked, they're shocked to see their ideas have been dismantled. Who 
did this? It must be Abraham. He's making trouble. Whenever you, whenever people who don't want you to think realize you can think, you're automatically a troublemaker. As soon as you start asking questions, you're a trouble. How am I a troublemaker if I ask questions? If you're transparent, you shouldn't mind me asking questions. If it is what you say it is, if your logic follows to a logical conclusion, you shouldn't mind me questioning it. Right? Because no matter what questions I throw at it, it's going to come back. You know, Allah says, take your, take, your, take your vision out and study the creation. Right? Come back and take it out again. It will return to you tired. Right? Because you're not going to see a flaw in God's creation. And something you think is a flaw isn't. God had already designed that to be in the creation. You just don't know how the creation works. So you, you may perceive it to be a flaw, but it's serving a purpose of God because you don't know how the universe works. So even if you think you figure it out and you see something that you think is an anomaly, it's serving a purpose that you don't realize it's serving because you do not comprehend the knowledge of the universe. So you may wonder what purpose a black hole serves. What's the, what's the purpose of a black hole? Right? It's serving some purpose. And God put it up there. And you can't even really perceive something that's gravity is so strong that light can't escape it. Right? You can't understand that. Yet it's up there. And it's serving a purpose. And God put it up there. So yeah, when you when we say look at the sky, that was that was for the time before they had telescopes. Before they had satellites. So the sky you look at is much bigger. Right? So when you look in the sky, you see it expansive and you see it continuing to expand. You know Mr. Hubble, Hubble, you know the Hubble telescope? When, when Hubble studied the stars, he saw the stars, the spectrum of the light on the stars was moving toward red. And that let him know that, that the stars were moving apart from one another. But they weren't moving apart from one another necessarily just like in a linear way. It was like a balloon. Right? And as I put, so if I, have a, if I have a dot on the balloon here and a dot on the balloon here, if I make the balloon bigger, they're going to be further apart, right? And if I make the balloon even bigger, they'll be further apart, right? So from understanding this, they said, if we can rewind time, eventually you'll get to the point where everything was together, right? So if I suck all the air out of a balloon, it comes back on itself, right? And this is where the idea of the Big Bang Theory comes from, right? Isn't that interesting? They call it the Big, Big Bang. Now, <clears throat> so, so from this they said, well, eventually everything was together, and if I keep going further back, eventually it's nothing, right? But science didn't have a way to express nothing, so they called it zero value. Zero value. If, 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 if it's zero value, what is it? It's nothing, right? And Allah creates from what? Nothing, right? 
And doesn't Allah say in the Quran, don't the unbelievers see that the heavens and earth were once together? And God split them a thunder? Right? Now the word for split a thunder is ratat. It means he unstitched them. Right? And then the universe began to expand. Now remember we talked about the black hole who can't, the light can't escape the gravity, right? So the expansion of the universe had to be at such a space or such a pace that it was fast enough that the universe wouldn't collapse on itself. In other words, you have all this gravity. So it has to be expanding fast enough that the gravity doesn't pull it all back together. But if it's, spin, if it's going too fast, it will spin out of control. Right? Because the universe is not expanding in a disorderly way. It's expanding in an orderly way, right? You have all these pieces of rocks shooting out. Then some form into big gas giants. And then they start the process of nuclear fusion. You know, I, I think the sun was like, the sun is really not burning like coal is burning. The sun is producing and releasing energy through a process of nuclear fusion, right? And then you get this big ball and it collects 11 rocks, 11 little rocks that start to circle around it, right? And on the third rock, the third rock is perfectly spaced so that it's not so hot from the sun that it burns up. You know, mercury, can y'all, did, 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 did it go up? Y'all can hear me, right? You know, mercury is burning hot on one side and freezing cold on the other. Because mercury, unlike the earth, mercury doesn't rotate on its axis. Mercury only has one side facing the sun and another side that's always not facing the sun. So one side is burning hot and the other side is extremely cold. You see the mercy of God? You see his signs that you have on the same planet, two extremes. That on one side of the planet, so hot, it could never sustain life as we know it. On another side of the planet, so cold, that it could never sustain life as we know it. Right? And then you jump out and there's Venus, and then you jump out and sitting in the middle of space, floating in space. So you're really on the mothership, aren't you? <laughs> Sitting in the middle of space, floating, is this big glow rotating on its axis, perfectly conditioned or distance from the burning ball, so that it's not so hot that it burns up, but on it are areas that are extremely hot, and on it are areas that are extremely cold. Right? But in the, in the whole mixture, you have perfect temperatures to sustain life. Right? So look at the sky. <laughs> look at the sky. Come back and look at it again. And your vision will come back to you tired. Right? So I look, and I look, and I look, and I look, and it keeps going and going and going, and going, right? And I come back, Ooh. oh, it's expensive. <laughs> then I look again, and then I decide, well, I can't, I can't put a number to it. So I give you a symbol, right? What is this symbol? Is infinity a number? It's a what? Concept. You get it? Concept. And how did Imam tell you to see the prophets? As concepts. And if you can see the concept, guess what? The concept will serve you from now on in your life because you're not bogged down on the physical form. This is liberating, brothers and sisters. This is liberating.
Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So Abraham, back to the order of Abraham, right? He sees the flaws, he destroys the idol, he leaves the axe on the biggest idol, and his people come back. Who did this to our gods? Why don't you ask the biggest god? Imam Muhammad. It shows that young that young men already had great wisdom. This is the quote, Imam Muhammad. He said, Father, ask the biggest one who did it. You have people worshiping these things, and they can't help you out. Just like I was rejected by my father when I didn't give him his answers. He didn't want my answers. He wanted his answers. Abraham was rejected, and like Moses, when Moses was exiled, God spoke to him directly. And when Abraham got exiled, God communicated to him on the highest level, and he became God's prophet and messenger, and our second father, and an imam for all the people. So look at the growth. Look at this young man challenging these ideas. And then when they want to burn him. Right? Don't debate with him. How about some debate? I, I stooped you. I asked you a question you cannot answer. So instead of facing the flaws in your own logic, you just want to get rid of the question asker. Get rid of the one asking questions. Get rid of him. Burn him up. Put him in the fire. Make the atmosphere intolerable for him. Put pressure on him. Concepts, remember. Don't think of a big burning oven. Right? The concept is what's important, right? Punish him. But what did Allah say? Be cool. He told the fire to be cool for Abraham. So I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm go back to some, some straight quotes from the imam on this because I, I don't want to miss it. But I got to give it to you straight from the source. Right. It is a pictorial script or screen put before your eyes. And it says Abraham was sitting contemplating the reality of matter. Isn't Abraham still contemplating that? If you understand the Abraham principle, he still is. He, mankind working upon the, the intellectual properties that God had given him, that's embodied and pictured and, and, and punctuated, made for us to see in the model of Abraham. He still is pondering the matter of cre uh, uh, what makes creation creation, right? How did this all get here, right? The order of the objective world looking for something that would point him to the knowledge of what authority should be governing man's life. The kingdom, so the kingdom could be established. The governmental order could be formed. And he saw, observed the heavens at night. We talked about this in Juma, right? And watched it until he saw the bright star, the brightest star in the sky for him that night. Some say it was Cyrus. And he looked at it and said, this must be God. So this is Imam Muhammad. Now understand, look at his progression. That must be God while he was watching some stars. Some fell. He didn't see the bright star fall. He just saw a star fall. What does this have reference to? Not the stars up there, but the people down here. Stars up there, really in the language of the wise who tell the common people, these idols are gods, we give them names. They know their intelligence won't permit them to really believe, have the superstition to believe that if they pray to an idol, they will get answers. 
but they put that on their masses to keep their masses out of their hair, to tie them up so they won't get into the hair of the ruler uh, asking for bread. Keep giving them water, keep giving them baby milk, and we will keep the bread. Keep them infants, and we will eat the adult food. So there are people who want to keep us toddlers in religion. They want to keep our ideas as toddlers. All right? So let's go on. They knew better. So when they were challenged, what did they say? You know these idols can't speak. But then they got diabolical. They are a mean for reaching God, right? So the language changed. So no, these idols are not God, but they are the means that we use to reach God. Imam Muhammad. They said they know the idols had no power, couldn't speak or anything, but they are means. Meaning this is our instrument, this is our connection for them that will connect them with God. An answer, a reasonable answer, but for the intelligence that God created man to have, no excuse for the injustice done to the common people. You are thieves, you are robbers, the book says. All before me were thieves. What does that mean? All before the truth of human nature and its value were nothing but thieves and robbers robbing you of the appreciation for the value of the good human nature that God gave you. Now, isn't that a heck of a thing to rob a people of? To rob them of their sense of human decency and convince them that by virtue of the fact that they are born, they are born evil and sinful. What does Allah say? La qadda khalaqna al-insana fi ahsani taqween. Thumma radatnahu asfala safileen. Certainly we have made man in the best of modes. Then he retards and becomes the most despicable creature. But that's not how I made him. I made him fi ahsani. In the most excellent taqween forms and modes for his nature that God created him. Now watch this. Once the truth of human nature and value comes to those who have been robbed, they will get their properties back. So your right as a human being, it is your inherent right to know of the good nature of human, of the good value of your good human nature. And yet there are certain people in society that benefit from you having a misunderstanding. And they will promote the misunderstanding in order to keep benefiting from you, oppressing you, taking advantage of you. But the Quran comes to free. And Imam Muhammad freed us. He freed us. And there are many people in the Muslim world right now that don't want you to question anything. Ask yourself, how did Bukhari and Muslim become canon and own level with the Quran? Have you ever asked yourself that? Or were you, well I know we weren't just told that. We were conditioned that the Quran was the end of the discussion. The Quran was the final say. And be very careful with hadith. I'm going to share, I was reading, you know, if you don't, if you don't read Arabic, this is not a knock against you if you don't read Arabic. Inshallah, I make dua that Allah will bless you to get to the point that you can read Arabic. And some of you will die never reading Arabic and you'll go to paradise. Because reading Arabic is not a prerequisite for you to make paradise. Having a good human nature and obe being obedient to God is the prerequisite. 
And there are some people who can't speak a word of Arabic, but they are so sincere in their heart that Allah will bless them. And there are some people who can speak Arabic in and out, grammatical analysis, everything, and they're wicked and corrupt, and they will be punished. So I don't want to make anyone feel bad. Now, I'm not telling you to be lazy. Don't say, well, we now I don't got to study. No, I don't have to study no Arabic now. No, that's not what I'm encouraging you. Study it and learn it. But when you read in Sahih Bukhari, when you're reading in English, you're going to come across a statement in there that would appear to be a hadith. It would appear to be a hadith. And it says, it reads like, I don't have it. And I don't have my phone, so I can't consult Sheikh Google right now. <laughs> Ask Google any question, you're gonna get an answer. And I can say you get the right answer. You can get plenty of answers, right? So I'm reading, I'm reading in the English translation of Bukhari. And in reading it, I come across a statement that says, in 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 the pre-Islamic days, I came upon a group of male apes. I wouldn't lie to you. I wouldn't lie to you about something this serious. You can Google it tonight. You even find some YouTube videos with people trying to explain it. Okay. Said so I came upon a group of male apes and they were stoning a female ape that had committed adultery. And I joined them. No explanation, nothing. Just sitting there translated in the middle of the page. No, no, where did this come from? Who said it? Why is it in Bukhari? So here I am, innocent uh, English reader who don't know Arabic. I'm told Bukhari is a second authority for Muslims. And I'm reading in the translation of Bukhari. And I come across this hadith that sounds like Mark Wahlberg is, is playing in it. Right? This is the planet of the apes. Right? And so I'm conflicted now, right? Because I've been conditioned to believe that Bukhari is the second authority. And everything in there is completely legit. So now I'm conflicted because my rational mind is telling me, ain't a female ape can't commit adultery. They all have an alpha male. <laughs> and when the alpha male gets old and he can't fight anymore he's replaced by another alpha male right so I'm like how did the ape commit adultery who married them <laughs> what was the process yeah, you in there. Who recited the ayah? Did they jump over the broom? Now the Arabic reader is going to see that this is not even a hadith. This is something. Some. This is something a man said when he was trying to give credence to an idea showing that it existed in nature. Right? So just exercise caution. Right? So I was on the internet and some Christians were wearing Bukhari out. They were wearing it out. They're like, what is this? In the most sacred authority to Muslims, there's this statement. It's not a hadith. So you, don't, you, you have no need for cognitive dissonance anymore. You don't have to struggle with it anymore. This is not a hadith. It's included in the collection of Bukhari, but it is not a hadith. It's a statement that a person made. It's not attributed to the prophet. 
It's not a tribute to a venerable companion, yet it's translated and sitting, sitting on the pages. Then the question comes, why would somebody do that? Why would you do that knowing that English reading people is going to read that? And they're not, they're not privy to the Arabic conversation that clarifies it. Thank God for Imam Waters of the Imam. Back to Abraham. <clears throat> they have been robbed of their excellent nature. They will get their properties back. And Jesus is a sign. Christians, peace be upon him. And what did they do? They sought to crucify him and to kill him and to rob all his properties, stripped him while he was helpless on the cross, according in their language. Remember, Imam Muhammad is clarifying in their language. Even though we don't have to believe that, it, that in that way, in the way they believe. So Abraham, he sat all night after he saw one star fall. He said, well, these stars are not God. They are subject to die and to fall. So he sat around a little longer. And when, he be, and when the sun began to come up, he said, oh, what magnificent one, right? Bright and magnificent. This must be God. Imam Muhammad, I told you, I said it was given as though it was a pictorial script on a screen or something, this story. What does it, what does it have reference to when it says he saw the sun and said this must be God? Right? And, when he, and when the sun came up and Imam Muhammad says, this is not really Abraham's problem. Abraham is a figure relating us to the problem. The problem of man is his search for the right authority to govern his life. He sees these stars in the night who separate themselves from the day, these heavenly, saintly, heavenly creatures, these top pious, holy people, he, and he sees. He is relating to us how he saw them and the brightest among them and said, this must be God. But he saw one of them fall. He knew that some of them fell, so he concluded that none of them could be God because they all have the same nature. They are all in the same realm. And if one of them falls, all of them are subject to fall. So he dismisses them and says, no, this is not my God. And when the sun came up, he saw the sun. He said, oh, this is the brightest. Oh, how beautiful and splendid, how bright, how magnificent this human intelligence the intellect of man, the rational, productive mind of man. When man saw that, he said, this must be God. And how many men are worshiping the intellect of man right now? How many men are worshiping the rational products of man to see that the rational mind is God, or at least is looking at the rational mind as God? Remember, I told you, Abraham is just a means of communicating to this, us to this, this to us. Not his personal problem, but the problem for man in the history of the search for the authority that should govern his life or should govern or should rule his government. He watched it, he saw it rise and reach his zenith, the intellect of man, the highest point at noon. He saw it start to decline and he could, and he did not question in any of these points because goodness came can come down and kiss the earth and bless it. He didn't have any problem with that. But when it went out, when the light went out, when Abraham had a problem with that, Abraham, Abraham, peace be upon him, said, my God is not one to set. So he even, we even see challenges in the greatest thing that God has given us our rational mind and our intellect, when it goes unchecked, we can begin to think we're God or that our ideas are God. And we'll talk about this more, inshallah, when we get to the conclusion of our prayer.
because uh, we're going to talk about the whole movement of prayer. Right? So Abraham <clears throat> repented. But he's not repenting for himself as an individual. He's repenting as a representative of mankind. Because he saw how his own ideas oppressed him. From realizing the great reality of who God is. And what God is. So he said, Inni zalam tu nafsi. I have wronged my own soul. I have oppressed my own soul. So Imam Muhammad in explaining this, he says, so Abraham making the repentance to God, not for himself only, but for the whole of humanity, but he puts it in the first person because he's the father. He's the teacher. He represents the freedom of the intellect. The first freedom, the first time the human being's intellect was completely freed. And he's speaking for all the enslaved and all the oppressed. Surely I have wronged or oppressed my own self and I confess my faults. And he goes on. See, God is, is the only forgiver of wrongdoing. He said, forgive me my fault, for none can forgive me my fault but you. He goes on with the prayer. You know, it is the prayer of Abraham. Wonderful, wonderful story of the human being, the issue of the human being's value in the center, right in the center. That's what the focus should be, the issue of the value of the human being. Now, isn't this a wonderful creature? Even though he goes wrong, eventually his search, in his search, he trusted his own material right? He should trust God. But how should he trust God? He doesn't know yet. So God created him above this, but created him to grow to the point that where he can manage that. So in his inferiority, God didn't say, God never told Abraham, you have sinned, did he? It was Abraham that came to the conclusion he has sinned. Once he came to understand that there was nothing in the creation worthy of his of worship, in neither lam to nafsi. Then, surely the one who created me, we said it's in Juma, right? Surely the one who created me will guide me. Now man's intellect is free to engage the material world while having an appreciation for the one behind the material world. Which he may not fully perceive or understand, but he's confident that I have enough in my makeup to be guided by God. Now, turn in Bakara. One. One twenty. Okay, it's 6.30. Do y'all need to stand up? Go ahead. Oh, subhanAllah. 7.30. Still in Houston. So take, take, take five minutes. Stand up, stretch out. Say something nice to the person next to you. <laughs> and we'll come. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Rabbil Alameen. والسلام والسلام على خير المرسلين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم 
wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in amma ba'da fa ya ibadullah usikum wa nafsi awwala bitaqwa ta'ala wa ta'atihi dear brothers and sisters as we is imam mansur around um turn look in bakara now remember all of our discussion about wasia right everything that abraham alayhi salatu wasalam that we see him going through is a growth in the intellect of man it's wasia he's expanding right and god is preparing him for a job we never know what God is preparing us for. I remember and and I and I share personal anecdotes to let you know that we're all real. Everything's we're all humans at the end of the day. I remember there was a period in my life that I was going through it. I mean, I was going through it. And I'm not going to say that I was depressed but without the help of God it could have easily become depression. I mean it was like the worst one like the worst personal challenges that I'd ever faced. Uh some burdens were coming down on me that were gut-wrenching. That were just absolutely gut-wrenching. and in the middle of it a very dear friend of mine who I was talking to uh, because i needed a friend you know sometimes you just need a friend <laughs> just need a friend to talk to right and you can't just go talk to anybody but as i was talking to him about what i was going through he said was well, there god is preparing you for something he said after you come through this there's going to be a, a, a certain amount of growth and things that you accomplish and he was communicating to me that you're going through this So when you face the challenges in whatever God has you do you're going to build the manage them better because you're going through this right now. And it was soon after that that we started a second message in Houston. There was already two, so we started a third message with uh that was influenced by Imam Muhammad leadership um but a group of young professionals came and they wanted to join the masjid but we were going through a rocky period at that time and i i and i know you may not have ever had one of these periods in Atlanta and inshallah I pray you never do have one but sometimes we go through these periods where there's fights all the time and every other week there's a fight at the masjid or an argument or something like that. And I knew if we brought them into that environment that it would kill their spirit. It would kill their spirit. So I told them, let's meet on the other side of town. I said, get the people who you have that want to join the masjid and let's meet on the other side of town. And that out of that grew a whole another masjid and the beautiful thing is it didn't take anything from the masjid that was already existing you know sometimes people split and they take a bunch of people but right but there was no as a matter of fact i said don't leave the other masjid intentionally because of all the people in houston 
if you, if, 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 if what the Imam, if, 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 if Imam Muhammad's language is what we say it is, we're either serious or we're just preaching to the choir. Right? We're either just telling each other how sound it is and how enlightening it is. Okay? But I figure that if it was what it was, it would attract people regardless. Right? And so, over a three year period, that masjid grew from 10 people in a person's living room to an independent musalla that was clean. People, a guy came in the masjid one day and he said, this is a masjid? I said, yes. And he had this puzzled look on his face. And he said, I have never seen a masjid this clean in my life. Y'all don't have that problem here. I understand that. But. And then now at that masjid, called Masjid al Quran, the first Juma is standing room only. It's nowhere near as big as here. Nowhere near as big as here. This is almost, this is standing room only almost. I think we can fit around 200 people in that musallah. It's standing room only. And we had to start a second Juma. And this mess just sits in the middle of a, of a five mile radius. You have five other masajid in this area. But they pass all the other masajid to come and hear the language of Imam Waratuddin Muhammad. So we start preaching to the choir. Now, also not too long after that period, Hurricane Ike came through Houston and destroyed what was at that time the Houston Masjid of Al-Islam. Lift up the roof, the, look, the roof fell back down on itself and one quarter of the roof was leaning off the building. And you know we have people giving us proposals of how to save the building. We can tack this up, we can tack that up. It was done. And the most gut-riching part was no insurance. The insurance had lapsed. Every doubter left the masjid. They're like, this is done. They didn't think we would ever recover, ever. Let me see how to. And I'm not technically challenged. I can figure this out. I'm just not used to this one. Okay, so I think this one goes like this. And that one goes like that. Nope. Let's try it the other way. Wasia, right? <laughs> no insurance. And people started getting on the internet. I never forget this brother wrote a story. A tale of two masjids. One masjid with insurance, one masjid without insurance. He was, he was wearing me out too. Man didn't have insurance on the masjid. I, it, it, the article was was criticizing me, but I had to give it to him. Man, he wrote a hell of an article, man. <laughs> that was 2008. Five, five, uh, two days, 
two days after the janaza of Imam Warathuddin Muhammad. That was September 2008. August 2010, we opened up the first masjid built from the ground up in the history of the United States of America on West African architecture since the passing of Imam Warathuddin Muhammad and named it Masjid Warathuddin Muhammad. And I always reflect back to the conversation I had with my friend who told me, you're going through this because God is preparing you for something to come after this. And you have to go through this right now so that when you face this other thing, it won't seem daunting. And trust me, for a community whose largest fundraiser was $50,000 in the history of the community, other than the time Muhammad Ali donated a hundred some thousand dollars to buy the masjid, the, 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 the prospect of raising $500,000 seemed daunting. But it is amazing what can happen if you have faith and go to work and don't worry about not doing it. Don't figure out why, how you can't do it. Man, y'all ain't gonna raise that money. Ain't you know what, nah, how you gonna, I, t I, called a, I called an imam. And it wasn't Imam Qasim, but another prominent Imam in our community. And I told him the situation. He said, what, what you gonna do? I told him, we gonna raise the money. How you gonna do that? How you gonna do that? I told him we're gonna have faith. And he said, okay, he said, okay, I'm gonna set a donation box up with my message. <laughs> but in under two years, we saw the completion and dedication of the masjid built on Imam Muhammad's instructions that I heard out of my own ear. He said, we're going to decorate the landscape of America with mosques built on West African architecture, with minarets. And what the community couldn't do in 30 years, they were trying to build a new masjid. God blessed a group of believers under heavy burden to do in two years. Why well, see, I, now I go to the message, I say, we're going to raise $100,000. I never forget the first time we raised $100,000. We had a big fundraiser. I told, I told, I, we, we told the community, we're going to raise $100,000. You could see the doubt. I never remember, I never forget that. I told everybody, we're going to raise $100,000. And so like we're in the middle of the fundraiser and we're at $30,000. And everybody's giving you that look. Uh-huh. Yeah. Where's your $100,000 now? Said we raised $100,000, right? But we kept having faith. And then all of a sudden, this man got on the phone. He started making phone calls. He said, Tech Beer, $25,000 donation. Got on this phone. He said, Tech Beer, another $25,000 donation. He got on the phone again. He said, Tech Beard, another $25,000 donation. In the span of around five minutes, $75,000 worth of donations came in. And I'll never forget the biggest doubter. He was sitting in his chair. He kept looking. He was shocked. He kept looking up at the board, at the total. Then he kept looking down in his paper. He thought he was in the twilight zone or something, man. How is this happening? Faith. So if I go tell that community now, we're going to raise $100,000, I say, say, man, what, are we going to, what, what do we need to do? Because they've had the experience. They have the muscle now. Right? Right? So Abraham is going through all of these challenges. All of these challenges. And through all of them, they're making them grow. Now, I need to ask Imam Suleiman, what time do I need to stop? Okay. Okay, so we have 15 minutes. <clears throat> so turn in your Quran to Baqarah. Uh, 
verse 124. And I'm just going to read it in, 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 um, in Arabic, I mean English. And remember that Abraham was tried by his Lord with certain commands, which he fulfilled. And then Allah said, I will make you an imam to the nations. And we are on the order of Abraham. Abraham is our imam. He is our leader. He is the leader for mankind. But he's a, lead, he's a leader in rational faith. He arrived at Tawheed through objective observation of the creation. And when he followed the logic of creation to his conclusion, that logic led him to La ilaha illallah. And he said, I submit myself to the Lord of all the worlds, the evolver of all the systems of knowledge. Right? So Abraham is tried. And he's given a job. And his job is imam. But he is, he's expanded now, hasn't he? He's not that little kid anymore, challenging the idols, right? He's went through a whole growth in his intellect. And a whole growth in his understanding. He has challenged the creational order. He has challenged the, the matter. And from studying matter, he has come to a conclusion of rest in his heart and his understanding of the creation and of the author of the creation. And now he's ready to be a leader. And as soon as he became a leader, again he showed great wisdom because what he asked God, and of my offspring, He answered, but my promise will not reach the evildoers. Imam Muhammad deposited this language in us all. And he took time to train young people. He had special classes in Chicago with a group of young students that he trained personally in the religion. One, one of the brothers and sisters, they have a class on, um, as you know, uh, uh, his wife Khadija is one. There's another dynamic young brother. Uh, where is he? Is where is Rashad from? Milwaukee. Yeah, I listened to Rashad on AM 360. You know, AM 360 is like our clear channel, and we don't have Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Michael Savage. We have Qasem Ahmed, <laughs> Yahya Abdullah. We have our own. We have our own uh, thinkers. And, 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 and talk show host. I, I, by the mercy of Allah, I even started hosting a show on Monday night. It's called Life Enrichment Radio, where you come to get your life enriched. But Imam Muhammad trained, so Rashad has a show. Rashad's show comes on right before mine on Monday night. Dynamic young brother. Mine is sharp, sharp as a tack. Very perceptive. And we celebrate that. We celebrate that because leadership always looks to the future and looks to cultivate and develop the future. So Abraham realizes, look, it's, it's, there's a time where I will not be able to do what I'm doing, but this mission has to be continued on. 
and those to come after me. So he asked God about his offspring. But God told him, this will not come to those who are wrongdoers. It's not within the reach of those who are wrongdoers. The prerequisite is purity. If you're smoking weed and drinking Mad Dog 2020, and you wonder why you're not getting the perception of the Quran, you don't have to ask that question anymore. You're not pure. It's not going to come to you unless you purify yourself. And if you're not pure, don't despair. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. Beg for forgiveness. Isn't that what we say in the dua we talked about earlier? La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa ma wusaha. Laha ma kasabat wa alayha ma At the end of that verb you say, wa fu'anni, wa khfir, I mean, wa fu'anna, wa khfir lana, wa hamna, anta ma'lana, fansurna ala al qawm al kafirin. Oh Allah, blot out our sins. Wa wa afu, wa afu anna, afu. Afu means I wipe your sins out like they never happen. Like you never committed them. God is not like us. We say I forgive, but I ain't forgetting. And as soon as you slip up, I'm going to remind you. You always do that. That's your problem. Right? Well, there's a certain forgiveness that God doesn't block. That's ghafr, according to how, how, how I understand it from the resources I was reading. When, when Allah, you know how Allah says, you'll see your good deeds and your bad deeds? Well, God will forgive you some things and you'll see them. Right? You're not going to be punished for them, but you'll see them. But, but Afu blocks them out. Like our brother today. What's his name? He took Shahada. Jackie Chan. That was his name, Jackie Chan. So today, Wafu An. An who? Allah blotted out his sins. As if they never existed before. And you get that opportunity to do a Ramadan. You can get our food during Ramadan. But we should be begging. If you go home and think about all your sins, you know we should be begging for forgiveness. Waqfir lana. Forgive us, warhamna, have mercy upon us. Anta ma'alana, you are our wali. Help us against those who reject faith. And not only do they reject faith, they want to influence us to be rejecters of faith. So if you're not getting the insight and the perception, work on purifying yourself. And isn't this what Ramadan is? The month of purification. You're purifying yourself. I mean, don't, don't break your fast, the spirit of your fast, by, 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 by behaving foolishly and doing, committing sin and, in the evenings and other times. The prophet, peace be upon him, said, if a man doesn't give up his evil doings, God has no need of him giving up his food and drink. So Abraham is looking for the future. And brothers and sisters, we have to look for the future. And we have to make sure we have the concern of our offspring. And Atlanta has always been a pillar at that because it has a school that addresses all ages, all the way up through high school. So let's make sure we give our children a good future, inshallah, and deposit this mission in them. So that concludes the introduction. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And when we begin tomorrow, inshallah, we'll begin with the dua of Abraham. And we'll go into discussing, reading the book of Salah and seeing how it is a picture of the rise and fall of civilization. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Yes, sir. Alaykum salam.